Hi, and welcome to Doherty Roundtable Talk. Today we are joined with some of our leaders from our St. Louis Business Unit, and we're going to discuss navigating your career path. Let's start with introductions. I'm Melissa Walling, and I am one of our senior recruiters here. I'm Kate Marshall. I've been with Doherty about seven years, and I am a principal consultant and have been in the client leadership role uh, for quite some time. Hi, I'm Susan King. I've been with Doherty also about seven years, and um, I am a principal consultant and LOS lead in the product engineering and innovation line of service. I specialize in big data. I'm Lauren Hilton. I've been with Doherty for about six years. Um, I'm a senior consultant and a competency lead uh, for mobile development, also in the product engineering and innovation space. Sam? I am Samantha Weller. I have been with Doherty for a year now. Uh, I am part of our data engineering competency leadership, and that is also part of our product engineering and innovation line of service. Fantastic. Now, I know that we've discussed in the past how you guys have gotten to where you're at, and they're such interesting stories, so let's kind of start there. Kate, how did you get to where you're at now? Yeah, so I went to St. Louis University, and originally I thought I wanted to be an accountant. Um, I got into the program, and I had to go through their information technology management one-on-one -on -one, 101 class in order to just get my business administration degree, and that course actually taught a, an SAP course, and because of my background in accounting, SAP came to me very easily. Uh, it, it was kind of a light bulb where I could connect all of the pieces of the business into one visual place, which was technology. And so because SAP came so natural and I uh, decided I didn't really like the accounting space as well, my professor kind of helped me find an internship within technology, which I had been looking for an internship within accounting for about two years. So it was a a blessing in disguise whenever I switched over from accounting to technology. And after college, I went straight into consulting. And I've been in consulting for uh, nine years now, surprisingly. But uh, Doherty has been a great place to continue and grow. And I've grown from an associate consultant to principal consultant. And I have been a client manager at one of our largest accounts. And so now I've moved over to another account and then helping to build that one from there. Susan, how did you get started? Sure, I went to a, a really kind of a hardcore liberal arts college and it was all about the humanities and then um, had a friend who wanted to take a computer science course and didn't want to do it alone. And so I took the course along with him and it just really ended up uh, being a, a great experience for me. I liked the problem solving aspect of it. It provided a nice kind of counterbalance uh, to everything else I was studying. And so I just sort of kept on with it and ended up um, uh, majoring uh, in computer science as well as um, English literature. And it was a lot easier to get a job <laughs> in the uh, computer science field. So I actually ended up with my first job, uh, my first real, real job as Computer Girl was my actual title, um, working for a, a company here in St. Louis, and I bopped around for quite a while after that uh, and got involved more in the data side of things and data warehousing and then ended up at Doherty about seven years ago. And I really enjoyed uh, that. I started out in much more like traditional data warehousing and have been able to move with Doherty into sort of the modern data architectures and big data spaces. And uh, so that's how I ended up where I am today. How about you, Lauren? Um, I also actually went to a liberal arts college, um, but to get an engineering degree, um, a more traditional engineering degree, so did a lot of studying more like mechanical engineering. Um, once I graduated, I always knew that engineering was kind of what I wanted to do. I also really like problem solving, uh, figuring out why things work and how. Um, when I graduated, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and ended up interviewing at Doherty um, and was able to make the switch over into software engineering. Um, here at Doherty, uh, so that was my first, I guess, real job out of college, um, have been here now for six years um, and pretty early on got very interested in mobile development um, and have kind of jumped around to a couple different clients 
doing mobile at almost all of them. Um, and now um, have grown from associate consultant to a senior consultant and competency lead uh, in the mobile space. What about you, Samantha? Yes, so my similar story is actually pretty similar to Lauren's. I did not go into college planning to get a computer science degree. I was really interested in engineering and just pursuing something that was really heavily focused on problem solving. Uh, I took a computer science class because it was elective and I had to take it for the degree I was going for uh, and ended up just finding more courses I was interested in from there. It truly wasn't planned out that I was going to pursue computer science, but every course I wanted to take fell under the computer science curriculum. So eventually it made logical sense to make the switch there. I think I was really hesitant to pursue something like this, but it really is at its core problem solving and being able to build new solutions and new problems. That's great. Um, thank you for sharing the backgrounds and how you got here. One thing that is was kind of common between everybody is you didn't expect to be here. Um, women in technology and techno, uh, technological fields is growing, but it's still small. Um, how would you guys say that your personal branding has helped you grow and helped you get where you wanted to be in this industry? I would say that um, when I first started in this industry, um, I was the, the only woman um, in the environment I was in uh, for my first few jobs, actually. And I felt a really heavy push, at least initially, uh, to kind of uh, be someone who uh, kind of was the glue, who held the team together, who did things like um, all kind of all the soft skill stuff, right? Like if anyone was having a birthday, if anyone had a significant event in their lives. And I, I always got this sort of push for, we know you do programming, but you know, you might be a really good BA because you like to talk to people. And so I had to kind of um, really like appreciate at the first hand that those skills were really valuable, but also think about my own personal brand, right? And do I really want to become a BA or do I want to make sure to really present uh, some of my more, uh, you know, uh, technical skills on a really consistent basis so that I make sure that like I'm demonstrating both, right? I'm demonstrating the soft skills and I'm demonstrating my technical skills and make sure that those get recognized too. Uh, so I think that I had to be really aware of that, uh, particularly, like I said, in environments um, really early on in my career. Uh, and I, I'm glad I um, sort of became aware of that <laughs> because I think that it would have been really easy for me to uh, end up uh, in a position where I really wasn't able to make use of some of the technical skills I had really gleaned um, if, if I hadn't sort of had a light bulb moment there and realized I needed to start making those skills um, come out front and center when I was talking to people. I think that's a really good point. Um, I think whenever people hear technology, they think either program manager or they think developer. Um, and technology as a career has so much to it. So somebody can enjoy being the dig down deep problem solver and be and do very well in the career, or they can also love the organization. I think um, you three are probably a little bit more into the weeds than I am. Um, I've been into the data and done more of the data analytics, uh, but also I really love the organization of products and projects. And so for me, uh, it was going from accounting where I liked the idea of looking at this big picture and looking at the numbers, uh, but not necessarily going in and coding. I went through a Java class. And that was not my favorite thing. I think I walked out of that class and I said, the only Java I want to touch from now on is coffee. <laughs> but for me, I like that you can do all of it. You can be analytical, you can be a problem solver, um, but you don't have to necessarily be hands on the keyboard. You can have those individual discussions if you really like people, um, or you can be heads down on that keyboard if that's what you choose. And so your personal brand is around figuring out 
what do you want to be? How do you want to represent yourself? Do you want to be that front facing person behind a product, like for a product to say, to go out to the customers and say, this is how we test. This is how you use the application. Um, this is how you use the website. Or do you want to be that person behind the scenes that says, oh, this is what the customer wants. I can do that. I can work through this. So figuring out what, what it means, personal branding is huge. First. I agree. And too. I also, oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Sam. <laughs> I was going to say, especially something I find is I have to be very intentional about where I want to go and what I want to accomplish. Because like Susan said, it's very easy to show you have strong soft skills or you are more interested in people and that team building and collaboration. And while that's important, what I value right now is really being able to dig deep and focus on the technical side. So you have to know what you want and where you want to go to, in order to effectively communicate to others and say, these are the type of problems I want to have. These are the situations I want to be in that'll push me and help me grow in the direction I want to go. And I think there's a tie between those as well. Um, you can have all the technical skills, um, but unless you can communicate those technical skills, sure. um, it's, it's a lot harder to get that point across. Um, I also uh, lean towards the more technical side of things. Um, I like being in technology, but one of the things that I find most interesting about what I do in technology is actually figuring out how to ex take all those uh, complicated ideas that we work in and explain them. Um, so that everybody can understand. Um, and I think for me, that is the balance of, of getting those, you know, knowing that I have some of those soft skills, but also bringing the, the technical depth um, to my career that I want to. Um, I really enjoy digging down in the weeds in the, in the technical stuff, so. And also, so when I was interviewing for jobs right out of school, like Lauren said, it is really fascinating that you're not only developing something and you can get into the weeds technically, but you have to create something that's actually going to be usable and fit into whatever ecosystem. And I think I felt really discouraged looking for jobs initially because I would say I want that big picture of how things fit into things and people would immediately go, oh, you should be a technical BA. So it's just navigating that as well. I think that I think both aspects are spot on, um, you know, the communication, but communicating what you want and, and being very vocal about that. Um, Samantha, you had talked about being intentional and um, mm -hmm. surrounding yourself with people that helped you get to your, your goals and what you actually truly wanted. So let's dive into a little bit about allies and mentors and talk to us a little bit about how that's affected getting you to where you're at navigating your career. Yes, so I'm a big fan of the idea of having your own personal board of directors. These are people that you trust that have experience in different areas that you can go to for advice and perspectives that you might not necessarily approach things from. Uh, I know for myself especially, I find it very difficult to speak up sometimes and so having people there that you can go to for advice and different perspectives, people with strong communication skills, people who know how to market themselves, people who are very technically savvy, people who know how to network. It's just having that diverse set of mentors and alleys that you can go to in different situations. I think also part of it is finding those people that are willing to give you feedback. Um, I don't know how many times I've asked for feedback and gotten, oh, you're doing great. Um, and to me, that's not the most helpful in terms of trying to grow myself in my career. Um, so finding those people that are going to be not mean, but honest um, and, and willing to help you out in whatever their area of expertise is. Um, just like uh, Samantha said, finding those people that help you with the, that are good at networking, that are good at public speaking, that are good at the technical skills, um, having a, a wide variety of those types of people to help you out. And yeah, I, think I think that variety is huge. Um, you're, you're saying not just are you, not just the core people that you're used to being around, but pulling from other industries can be just as helpful to give you an outside perspective. Um, pulling within your company is always good because then they're going to have a direct interaction um, and see how you were in a meeting and they can give you that direct feedback. But having that um, directness for the feedback is huge too for somebody not just to say you're doing a great job but instead say you know you could have done this better in these ways 
And, you know, you did the best that you could at the time that you did it, but let's work through this together and see how we can improve. Those are going to be the mentors that really help to guide you and move you. And especially if you can find those earlier in your career, that's ideal. And these might be people that you have specifically said, will you mentor me? Or they're just kind of the one-off mentors where they gave me really great feedback that one meeting that I was in with them. Thank you. That was a mentorship. You don't have to always have somebody that is that formal mentor in order to get that information that you're looking for. You can take individual comments and that can be just as much of a mentorship as it is if it's a formal sit down every month or so. I think that's definitely true. I think one of the most valuable pieces of feedback I ever got was from someone I've known. Um, I went into a meeting uh, and after the meeting, um, this is fairly early in my career, I, I left the meeting room and a woman walked up to me and said, I don't know you're with, if you're aware of this or not, but you end almost every sentence with the phrase, you know what I mean? She said, and some people will respond to that fine. And some people think that you really don't believe they could possibly know what you mean. <laughs> and I hadn't even noticed that, that I was doing it. And, um, but I certainly noticed it from that point on. And I actually kind of made her just sort of mentally one of my mentors. And I remember like kind of observing her communication style in the meeting and kind of trained myself out of doing that almost by pretending to talk like she did for a few meetings to kind of get myself in the rhythm of not using that verbal tick. And it took me a while to work myself out of it. But I mean, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that one piece of feedback that I really feel it just took one person to tell me, hey, you're doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think also it's important for me to keep in mind now, um, you know, to be a mentor too. So to be willing to tell people things sometimes that may be a little hard to hear um, and also to, to just, you know, to reach out the hand um, and to really try to establish those relationships with people that, uh, I, and I try to do this especially with other women that I work with to, um, you know, let them know that I'm available to give them um, honest feedback and to kind of be the mentor that I, I really wanted and um, ended up finding. And I found male and female mentors. And um, like I said, sometimes it was just a matter of me asking them. And sometimes it was a matter of me too saying, I don't really know them well enough for that, but I really admire this particular way they handle themselves. And I'm going to try to model myself after that. So That's important though, too. Um, giving feedback is just as valuable, but I think one of the big things that sometimes gets lost in giving feedback is asking someone if they even want the feedback. <laughs> uh, I've had, <laughs> I've had a mentor that she and I will be talking and she'll say, may I give you some feedback? And just that question, I'm like, of course, absolutely. But it puts me in the mental stance to say, you know what? I asked for this. I'm, I'm not going to be offended by whatever feedback is coming. This is an opportunity for me to learn and grow. And we forget that subtle question whenever we provide feedback that maybe somebody isn't ready for that. So I think there's always that kind of thing to note whenever you're talking about giving and receiving feedback is, is the person open to it or are you just getting unsolicited feedback and sometimes that comes off in the wrong way. <laughs> Hey, will you be my mentor? That's good. <laughs> I think we'd have a lot to share. <laughs> so, you know, as consultants, we're changing, you could change um, clients and engagements. I know, Kate, you had mentioned that earlier. Um, as your changing clients or engagements or teams. One thing that is often brought up is how we navigate problems or um, move roadblocks, remove roadblocks, um, and how you've done that throughout your career to actually be successful as a consultant. So what have you found, Kate, especially since you've just changed um, engagements, let's talk about that. How have you seen that as um, a challenge in the different engagements that you've gone on? 
I think one of the big things about consulting is you're always mentally preparing yourself for a shift. Um, that's what I've always loved about consulting is that you're constantly learning. You're constantly being thrown into these situations that you may or may not be ready for, but you're always flexible and you're accepting that change is not a bad thing. Change can open doors that you wouldn't have thought, and maybe you're going to find something that you were even better at whenever you move into it. Um, there is a fear and a thrill <laughs> all at once with change. I'm sure many people are feeling that in the current uh, pandemic. You know, we, we don't know what's coming and there's some fear that comes with that, but there's also so much opportunity. And if you can focus on that opportunity and really say, you know what, I'm going to come in this with an open mind. I'm going to dive in and get my feet wet and figure this out and try to keep your nerves at bay <laughs> when you're going through it. There's so much more to gain from that. And that's what I really love. But I think the mental state and like just making sure that you have that own shift in your brain is what's going to open those roadblocks and allow you to problem solve quicker. Um, because if you keep sticking on, well, this is the way that I've always done it, you're not going to get as far. Um, you can gain on those insights from the experience that you've had, but you've got to be open to doing it in a different way and seeing if maybe that's an even better way to do it. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of active listening that goes on when you first uh, change clients or engagements. Um, uh, listening to what those uh, roadblocks might be. Um, and then for me, it's always trying to draw on my experiences and the information that I've just gained uh, to try to figure out how to help problem solve. Um, because that's the part of my job I really like, right, is the problem solving bit. Um, so how to get, um, basically absorb as much as you can so that uh, when you go to help solve those problems, you're, you're armed with as much information as you can be. I think it's a good point about listening as much as you can and just absorbing it all, but also make sure to ask questions and ask those stupid, dumb questions that you might think everyone else in the room might already know, but in reality, you have to make sure that you're all communicating on the same page. One of my old coworkers used to walk into the room and say, explain this to me as if I know nothing. So I think you always have to go in with that mindset, even though you might have you know, an understanding of how the project works and a good understanding of the tech stack, there's just so much leveling of communication styles and making sure you're coming at it from the same perspective. That, that's true. I think um, that was two good points. Uh, one, active listening. I try to do a lot of listening and then repeating back with what I'm hearing you say is to make sure I'm really understanding it in my own terms. And then uh, that also reminded me too of one of my favorite clients that always say, okay, I'm a golden retriever. Explain to me. <laughs> right? and, uh, and that really had helped me challenge to um, do I really understand this? So I'll say that sometimes to myself now. Okay, if I had to explain this to a golden retriever, uh, how would I do it? And if I can't really do that, then maybe I need to ask a few more questions. And um, I, I think sometimes it can be really difficult to get engaged at a new client. I did have a, one experience where um, someone just didn't want to work with me. Um, uh, an employee was really fond of the person who had been in the role I was in previous, uh, who the person who had been in the role previously, and um, just made it clear <laughs> that uh, what wasn't really thrilled about working with me. And I remember saying, well, uh, you know, this isn't going so well. I think we're just going to have to get used to each other and try this again tomorrow. And I just had to be really sort of patient and persistent. And appreciate too, I think sometimes that um, kind of give people the benefit of the doubt and realize that sometimes I think particularly when we're dealing with um, new situations or organizations where there's been a lot of churn or change, just try to keep in mind other people's feelings around that uh, and to um, just sort of build trust incrementally and be patient with that process. Yeah, I also think there's a little bit of a tie back to that personal branding conversation we had earlier. Uh, I remember walking into a room and I was clearly not what was expected. Um, coming in as a developer and figuring out what questions to ask and asking a lot of questions, um, I was able to 
kind of earn the respect and trust of the people I was working with um, just, you know, by listening and asking questions, um, they kind of came to realize, oh, you know, this does make sense. Like, here's what you're doing. You understand the technology we're working in. Um, and the, the questions you're asking tell us that, you know, you are confident in your skills and you have the skills uh, you said you did. Yeah. And whenever you have those discussions, I think it, how you see yourself is just as important. Um, one of the things I think specifically as women is sometimes we self-incriminate. Uh, we say like, oh, I, I just don't understand or I don't know enough. But really, you probably do. But the reason you ask questions is to confirm what you know. And so state that. State the things confidently because you do know what you're talking about. Um, it's okay to ask questions, but be sure that whenever you ask those questions, you say, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that you're confirming my understanding. Um, but also, how do you represent yourself when you sit in those meetings? Are you um, sitting way back in the corner and not participating in the discussion? Are you the first person that somebody within the meeting is gonna say, hey, Lauren, I would be really interested in what your insights are on this. But if you show up, uh, you know, lean in <laughs> as the books say, but be at the table, be part of the discussion. And also um, see yourself as a woman and not as a girl. I think that has probably been one of the biggest mental shifts for me. And I keep going back to like how you see yourself mentally. Because I think for females, that's probably the, one of the biggest hurdles in technology. We are surrounded by quite a bit of um, gentlemen around us, and we have to advocate for ourselves in a little bit different way. And we have to be a little more confident than what we might be um, if we were surrounded by our normal circle. But it's okay to you know, stand up for yourself. It's okay to be confident in what you do. Now, there's a difference in confidence versus um, overconfidence, right? But understanding that you, are, you do know what they're referring to and you are at the table, you are part of a discussion that you're not, um, you're not an intern who's learning again. You're part of the team and it's okay to be represented as part of the team and give yourself that mental acceptance that it's okay, you're, you're there, you're part of the discussion, and they care about your insights as well. So be confident to provide those whenever it's, that option is available, speak up. I remember uh, someone I worked with fairly early on uh, is a, a, a male coworker of mine, and he had tons of self-confidence, right? And he always used to say, like, before we go into meeting, he'd say, get out your popcorn, I'm about to put on a show. <laughs> and I'd be like, I could not, I was like, I cannot imagine having that much confidence in myself, right? Like, and I would always, I would sit there fairly quietly and think, I have a question, but man, maybe they already answered the question, I shouldn't ask the question. And it, it took me a while to realize, okay, I maybe need to be halfway between where I am now and where he is. <laughs> because, uh, you know, maybe that veered a little bit into bluster, maybe a little bit beyond confidence, but like, I had to kind of take that leap of faith in myself, right? Like to get a little bit of that attitude. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say your popcorn level, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you do just have to be definitely try to just, you know, push yourself beyond that self doubt. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but I have always had the mentality that good work will speak for itself, which I mean, it does to a certain extent, but you also have to be willing to speak up for yourself. And that's something that I struggle to wrap my head around because I'm like, okay, if I work really hard and do good work, it'll speak for itself. But there's that extra piece where you have to make sure that you're still advocating for yourself. Yeah, I think that um, everything that you guys talked about so far has been fantastic. Um, as we wrap it up, what would be one piece of advice that you would give people kind of coming into the industry or even women coming into technology? Kate? So I would say don't pigeonhole yourself into one, one piece. I think there is so much to be done within technology that be okay with starting someplace, 
maybe isn't going to be the place where you end. And what you learn in the, in the beginning is going to help you get to that end point. And so I think just allowing yourself to be flexible in your career is going to be probably one of the biggest pieces of, of advice that I can give. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that. I was uh, going to say something along the lines of um, be comfortable with change. Um, try to get comfortable with change and think of yourself as a work in progress. And also don't be unwilling to bite off something that seems a little overwhelming at first. Um, because I mean, that's really the way that you can drive some of that change. Um, so some of the times I think that I've been most scared to do things um, have really uh, turned out to be the most positive moves in my career. Uh, when I felt, uh, you know, not way in over my head, but a little in over my head and really had to rise to the occasion. So, you know, don't be afraid to challenge yourself with those things and, um, and try to welcome the change that they'll bring. And I agree with both of those things, but I also think that there's an element of, if you see something that you're interested in or that you, you're, you want to be a part of that group or in a role, don't be afraid to speak up and ask for it. Um, sometimes uh, being able to go with the flow is really good. And sometimes uh, you, you get stuck in it um, and you, you have to kind of raise your hand and say, I'm really interested in doing this. How do I get there? What, what do I need to do to move on? Yeah. And just to build off of all of that technology is evolving so quickly. And I'm such a firm believer that the jobs that will exist in, you know, even three years from now don't exist currently. So just stay curious, invest in yourself, learn from the people around you and keep an open mind and learn as much as you can. That is great advice. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation and I, we want to just thank our team here today and those of you watching. Um, have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys.